Time to do a podcast. Oh yeah. Right. <laughs> Hello everyone and welcome to the Shoot Out Podcast. I'm your host Ross Baxter and today is, it's crazy, today is episode 48. Um, things are just going like madness right now. And um, We'll be at episode 51 or 50 odd by the end of this week so stay tuned. And then, but today... We've got a legend returning. We've got James Ward on the show. How you doing, man? Welcome back. Round two. Here we go. Oh, man. He, he's just like, oh, gosh, Ross is already... See, this is what I did to Kieran. This is what ha- this is what you have to do every now and well. You just have to kind of get the energy flowing, do some just random stuff. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I've, got, I've got a can of Coke. That's, that's my energy at the moment. That's your energy. Just waking up, get the peps and the can of Coke down. Yeah. Oh man, don't talk to me about Pepsi. Oh, you're not a fan. It's too flat. All like, right, okay. That, that's yeah. Cool. I, I, I think I'll give you. I'll, I'll give you that one. Yeah, I'll, I see where you're coming from. Um, if you're new to the podcast, as always, the Shooter Podcast is a weekly series where I bring on guests from the games and film industry. We are live on Anchor, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Breaker, Overcast, Pocket Cast, Radio Public, and last but not least, Stitcher. And then this is a new update, so I'll be kind of introducing it briefly in the last few episodes and series. So the Shoot Art Podcast is soon going to be going live uh, on Twitch and YouTube. So I can finally start streaming everything on multiple platforms just so you guys can experience it live. And then if you wanted to ask, uh, so for example, the guests a question, we can then interact and do it that way. So stay tuned for that. I'm moving house at the moment. Uh, I move next week. Um, so I'm just everything's a madness right now, but with all that said, let's get into the podcast. Hello again, uh, James. How's things? Not too bad, man. Uh, life's been mad, uh, <laughs> basically. Um, everything kind of popped off after uh, after last po- podcast. So um, I got something exciting coming up that I can't say just yet um like specifics um I had a couple of people reach out to me after the last podcast which was pretty cool awesome so happy to have you here yeah um and I've even started uh so I've got two people that um kind of mentoring at the moment as well which is kind of wild <laughs> it's, it's, it's crazy how everything just like falls in like once once you've like kind of done like something like or like once you've kind of got i, I guess an opening everything just kind of pops off and it, and it feels great <coughs> yeah it's 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 weird because um like with I'd, I'd i'd say like the throne room was kind of like a big catalyst because that kind of got me on your radar a bit it got me on a couple of people's radar mm-hmm. and then ever ever since that like it's it's been nuts <laughs> <laughs> it's been it's been stressful like i'm pretty sure i've got a couple of great hairs now but um <laughs> oh man you just see that bank account balance just getting skinnier and skinnier and you see and it's like, <laughs> 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 um but yeah it's it's been good. Like, what about you? Uh, yeah, th- things are going great. I've, I've actually so I started, um, so I've started this new this new sort of um, art piece and new series, uh, similar, to, pretty much exactly like you. So I'm making a throne piece, and mm. um, but I'm like adding my own sort of twist and making my own interpretation of um, Game of Thrones for Brand the Broken. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I thought it might be because I get the I get the notifications every every time you go live and. Uh, Every time you um, post a video to YouTube, yeah, I, I don't know. It's just that I wanted to kind of switch things up because, so the podcast will never stop. So the podcast is obviously uh, one of the main focal points of everything. But I really want to kind of get things going when it comes to environment art and kind of get um, more people kind of um, seeing how I work and stuff. And then I guess also with the podcast, like hearing how you guys work and stuff. And uh, because obviously I've talked so much about student education that. Um, like there's only so many topics you can talk about. Obviously, there's a, <laughs> there's a lot of subjects I can bring up or kind of twist things around or try and explore explore and experiment. But um, no, I think things are going great. I've just uh, I think the only thing with me at the moment is that because because I'm moving house, that things are a bit hectic. If you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, that's always a big thing. 
So, as always, man, um, so I, t- I told you briefly how the thing, how, what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to be talking about a few different um, awesome topics, and mainly, um, it's going to sound so obvious, we're talking environment art people, oh my <laughs> gosh, what's the chances of that? But um, we're really going to be going into depth about environment art instead of, so obviously, we always talk about student education for so the first time, so if you're unaware, we had this legend already on the podcast, so go check out that one, and most importantly, go check out his work, give him a follow, go spam his follow button, uh, follow button, you know how it works, and most importantly, obviously environment art is both our things, so that's what we both do, and the one thing I want to talk about today is Unreal Engine, so your time as an artist using Unreal, and talking about like fundamentals, the, the one really interesting topic um, I decided randomly to bring up, just because it came into my head, was business, so... These are all the, kind of like the pillars we're going to base today's podcast around. So stay tuned, enjoy it, and let's get to it. So, I guess the, the just well before we even start, just tell us a wee bit about yourself, as always, man. Uh, I'm James. Uh, I'm 24 years old. Uh, I'm an environmental artist in Derby. I, stu- I studied at Staffordshire University. Um, I originally wanted to be a narrative designer, mm-hmm. uh, and then. In my first year, in my intro to 3D classes, I fell in love with 3D. Uh, I, l- I was taught 3ds Max. I use Maya um, for the vast majority of things. Um, just because I, I prefer the UI, <laughs> to, to be honest. Um, yeah. I'm big into ZBrush like for my environmental pieces, uh, particularly oh, yeah. on, my, on my last piece. Um, substance painter, substance designer. Uh, I use UE4. Mm-hmm. Uh, I do know a little bit of Unity, but I cry <laughs> every time I use it. <laughs> I don't do code. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a whole other ball game to me. I, I'm a guy. I've, I've dabbled in Unity a few times, uh, but like, nothing against Unity. But I've just never. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's just not. I don't know. Unreal is just more cooler. I'm sorry, but it is. I prefer the UI in UV4, and and the fact that like everything is there rather than having to download like a prefab. Mm-hmm. Um, I prefer that. I know that in those regards, Unity can be more flexible or specialized depending on like what you're making. But I think it's important for a game engine to have everything there for it to be as user friendly as possible in but still have a fantastic result at the end of it yeah like that, that's the thing so um i i would consider myself so i used to uh, work in unreal quite a bit but i've not um worked in it for quite a while now um it's because obviously um so i was kind of looking into going for like a vfx sort of approach like a render really looking for like that sort of cinematic look however um, in the last year, I've been kind of stepping back into like the game realm and really exploring how things are going. Like for example, I'm back to 3ds Max again, and um, obviously Unreal. It's like one of my, one of my friends, um, Eddie. So Eddie, he works at Rockstar, and uh, he's a uh, amazing, amazing lighting artist. And he talk, he never, he never stops talking about Unreal. Like it's always Unreal this, <laughs> Unreal that. It's like, and then the, the excuse the common pun, but it's Unreal, as as they always say. But, oh, um, I've made that joke too many times. Oh, it's, 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 you can't beat a classic, okay? A cl- the, the, most, the worst jokes are the, cr- the the best jokes are the cringy jokes. The ones that are just like so stupid and just so like like why on earth is he saying that? Like a cringe smile is hilarious. It's, it's nothing <laughs> nothing more better or more funny than someone going through an awkward moment. You're like, uh, <laughs> it's just it's just so funny. It's like that meme with that. Um, this it's the stock photo guy that he's smiling but it looks pained. <laughs> Just like, Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. He's like, I hate my life. Because <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know. Unreal is like, um, so obviously like, Unreal has been used for by so many artists and stuff over the years. But if you had to like, say you had to promote Unreal, like, what would you say is like the main reason why you use Unreal? So obviously you said the interfaces or any kind of, uh, like, what's what kind of draws you into Unreal and why do you think uh, students should be using it? Um. Well, it's free. <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, uh, like Unity, though, it's it's a it's a triple A engine that is completely free. You've got access to everything. I think you've even got access to the source code. Um, 
Epic Games does a fantastic job of constantly updating it, um, like with the the content that's free for a month as well. Mm-hmm. That is nuts. Like you're getting content that's worth like eighty quid a piece on on some of them, completely for free. Um, and if I remember rightly, if it's on the marketplace, it can be used for commercial purposes, right? Uh, ooh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's. I right. think so. I think. I, yeah. I think you're right. I think you're right. Which is nuts if you're an indie developer or like just a. Even if you're like coming up to, um, just about to start university and you're just kind of thinking of getting into games and stuff like that, like you can really, really easily just bash together your own like first level or first game just with assets that already exist. Yeah. For example, like they released all of their Paragon assets, which were worth it was in the billions, wasn't it? What? Right, okay, I didn't. I didn't hear about this. She was. I'm getting. I'm just getting. I'm getting news. I didn't know about this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was like a a year and a half ago, something like that. Like okay. When when they shut down Paragon, the Paragon servers. Yeah. They released like all of the Paragon assets for for free. Right. Wow. Uh, they're all up on the marketplace. Um. And it's like, like the the estimated worth of them was was ridiculous, um, and it's all AAA models. So like, even if like you you like want to be a character artist, you can mm-hmm. download that model, take it into UE4, and see the quality benchmark that you have to get. Yeah. Uh, it's the same with like environmental pieces. Like you can see how things are broken up for the multiplayer maps. You can see, um, what the this is more like a UE4 specific thing, but you can see how they've done the blueprints. You can see yeah, how they've yeah. done the code. Uh, you can see how they've lit the levels and stuff like that. It is insane. Like, and oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I was just gonna say is like because uh, you said there about the blueprints. <coughs> the blueprints was the like originally when I came across the blueprints, I was terrified. I was like, oh my gosh, this is just the this is something that I I, I don't know. I, I didn't want to kind of look into, and uh, like that's why when I first saw Designer, I was like. Oh my gosh, this is like, uh, it's epic, but it's scary. And um, once I realised, though, how powerful Unreal is, if you know what I mean, just in terms of, like, the nodes and stuff, and what it offers you, and, like, that's the great thing as well. It's like, there's so much, like, I know a lot of people say it when it comes to software, but Unreal can literally do, like, pretty much everything. And when you have that open sort of freedom to kind of explore into everything related to games, it's it's such a blessing, and it has so much things that you can utilize. And like 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 you said there about the library and stuff, like the the free sources. So, um, I know about what four four so four artists. So and, and three of them have come on the podcast, and literally, um, and the majority of their portfolio is Unreal Marketplace, um, environments that they've used. To then light their scenes because they're lighting artists. And they, mm. they can obviously use that for their portfolio. And going back to the really great point that you made there, which was um, you can see how like the standard of the models. And having that, um, I guess, reality check, so being able to see how things are actually made um, and then like bring them into your scenes and seeing how things actually work and stuff, like that's crucial because um, I'm, I, I'm, I assume you were the same as me. So... Do you know when you think, um, so say early on in your art career, you're like, oh, I, I'm amazing. I, I'm making the best art possible. <laughs> and then you're like, it, then you open up at like an art session done by a pro. And you're like, yep, I'm not amazing anymore. <laughs> and you're just like, you, you realize how far you have to step, like how much you still have to go, if you know what I mean? Yeah, so I had that when I was at college. Mm-hmm. Uh, I went to Derby College um, and they have like a, a, a games design course. <laughs> And every single day, I'd, I'd I'd be modeling, I'd be I'd be working away. Um, th- this is gonna hurt to admit, but <laughs> um, I I was that guy that never used reference. Mm-hmm. Uh, I never I never thought about using reference or anything like that because like we weren't taught three D for the most part. Like if a lot of what I learned that I did just like plan around uh, in the modeling packages so I had no idea about UVing I had no idea about um, textures or uh, model optimization or anything like that <coughs> excuse me I didn't even know that you had to collapse a model 
to export it as a single <laughs> object into UE4. Right. <laughs> so that was always a bottleneck, like trying to like reassemble it and stuff. I was like, why is this <laughs> like this? Hey. Is this the same for every single game or like <laughs> or whatever? But um, and then I got to uni, and I it was like by my second week, I just kind of sat there. I was like. Everything I know is wrong, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then like that kind of kicked out of me fairly quick, and then just kind of surrounding myself with the guys that I did mm-hmm. it, at the uni just made me so much better, like as an artist and as a person, really, to be honest. Because like I think it's it's so important for you to draw inspiration from the people around you. Mm-hmm. Oh, definitely, definitely. Um, if you see someone that is an absolutely fantastic artist, don't be like, oh, ah! <laughs> Sorry, I just, I <laughs> don't, just don't be like, ah, you deserve us. Um, We're definitely keeping that in. That's great content. <laughs> That's sound effects, people. See, see, this is what you get on the Shootout podcast. You don't just get great content. You get sound effects as well. Oh, that wrecked. <laughs> <laughs> you okay, man? Because <laughs> I can see his, cap- his webcam, he's just like, it, right, pain, right now. I'm, I'm sorry for laughing. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> oh, well, that uh, happened. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's going to stick with me for a while. Um, well, you'll be awake now. Yeah. It's like, if you if you see someone that's, that's absolutely fantastic at art and, and like what they do, like, don't be that guy that's like, oh, fuck that person. Like, because... Yeah. One, no one likes that person, and two, like you're only holding yourself back. Like, imagine what you could learn and how your art could grow if you just went over to that person and was like, "Hey, man, how did you do this?" Mm-hmm. Or, "Hey, can you give me some feedback on on my work and, and all that?" Like, use. It's 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 mostly like changing like your mindset that helps with everything, like whether that's like working in your modeling package, Unreal Engine, sculpting, texturing, lighting, like it, it's weird because I was I was talk, I was in uh I was in Stoke the other day, mm-hmm. just visiting a couple of guys from uni and um, we're actually talking about like attitudes that we'd notice like throughout the university experience okay like it's so because um like there's there's some people that, that we've noticed that have gone like in the first year that are like oh you know like I, I want to want to put my best foot forward and uh learn as much as I can and just soak up everything that I can and get really motivated and all of that to then by the end of, and I think I think like universities are kind of like the problem with this in, in this regard but they come out of the course and then they think that they owed something yeah do you know what I mean oh I, I completely agree uh, this is an awesome point to bring up yeah um, like I think attitudes in generally need like need to be addressed a little bit more mhm um, during the whole learning process because you only get out what you put in exactly. so if you put it all in at the very start and consistently do it not only are you, you going to be a better artist in, or a better programmer or designer or whatever but you're going to come out with a much better or more chance, think of the word. Like more chance of getting something out of it. Yeah, 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 and, and, and like a better outlook and stuff like that as well, because it's it's really surprising. Like, like over the last three years, that like how many people that I've noticed that have kind of adopted that. But I wouldn't say it's their fault. It's more the environment they were in before. Mm-hmm. Like, you know what I mean? yeah. Oh gosh, you've just brought tons of different things to my mind because it's like a. The one scary, um, the one scary thing that um, I've realised is that, like, do you know when you're in first year? Obviously, there's let's say 
Let's just say, uh, we'll just say 100 people. Say in first year there's 100 people in one, one year. Obviously that's quite a lot, but say there's 100 people. It is very common or very likely that there's only 30 people at the end of fourth year. Like, like if you know what I mean, yeah. the drop off is, 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 is crazy. Like, you'll see, like obviously some people in first year, um, they're in first year and they've they found the reality in, in terms of the truth of if they're passionate or not. Maybe it's not for them, then they leave, then that's okay. Like they're just, they're trying things, they're exploring things. But speaking on, like, continue on this point that you're talking about, there's so many people in my, uh, in for example, I so this 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 will shock you, right? Um, when I was in my first year, so I did a H and C in three D computer animation. There was 30, 34 of us in the class, right? At the end of it, how many of them do you think continued three D? Four. Just me. Oh damn! Literally just me, um, and it was mental. And so, obviously, so tons of people went to that course, and the course that I went to was amazing. Like they had, they were spoiled for choice as well. But it was, it was literally just me. And I think it's just because a lot of people. So this is a point that um, I don't think I've ever I've actually brought in the podcast. But oh gosh, this is going to be a good point because people are going to get a real <laughs> check when this happens. So. This is what my um, what my lecture t- uh, one of my lecturers taught me, uh, or he brought up all the co- uh, so the common mistake a lot of artists make when they first start out. So the reason why most people apply to game courses is because they think they're going to play games. Like they yeah. think like they apply to um, game art courses. So say for example, uh, take Al- uh, Albert A University for example. They've applied there because they think making games means playing games or something. They have this sort of um, delusional mindset as if in they're going to be playing games at an art course for some reason like obviously they'll be playing games like obviously like we're, we're all gamers at the end of the day we love games or like we love to make and design games and stuff but that's not the reason why um, you should be applying if you like you shouldn't be well you shouldn't be applying just to play like if you're thinking you're going to be playing games you know what I mean yeah 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 um, I noticed that like as early on as, uh, as college because Excuse me. There was, um, I think, for me, I noticed it more in college than I did uni. That was more because like the class was a lot smaller. So, for example, um, I think each year, I think the last year's intake for Stafford University for the games department was about three thousand. Wait, what? Three? What? Three thousand students in the like new students. In, that's not what? what was already there Jeez. yeah like my my intro to 3d class in my first year had two classes and i'm pretty like throughout the week and i'm pretty sure each one had at least 100 people in yeah that's, that's um bad. and that and that was just a module that wasn't necessarily like the entire course so my original course was games design Mm-hmm. which was a very kind of like generalist one so you could try a little bit of design you could try a little bit of 3d and see which one like you wanted to fall into yeah and end up specializing in and uh i remember in the first few weeks of intro to 3d uh the epic games lab was full bearing in mind the epic games lab needs four projectors Yep. If it's full for everyone to be able to see it, and it's got two front desks, um, it's got microphones so that like everyone can hear left to right, and uh, it's it's huge. By the end of that, whether that was people just not turning up or dropped out or whatever, it was lucky if you had twenty people in it. It's mental for a lecture. Um, I don't know how true this is, but. Uh, I remember overhearing, like, at the start of my second year, we went from 200 people on the course in in first year, at the start, to at the start of second year, we had 50. Yep. Um, and that was just games designed up. Like, the biggest one is games art, which is why I ended up switching to for my third year, which was like a... Yeah, to like a art specific one because there was a certain module that I wanted to do that's, um, that's crazy because you, you just I am um, this is another this, no, this is really good because this, this is another point I've never said on podcasts and it's uh, attention span so 
everyone who goes to the course, right? So everyone who goes to the course, naturally they have so much energy when they first start. I think, um, well, it's so obvious, it's not, I'm pretty sure everyone has this thought, but universities have to find a way how to keep um, students interested. And the biggest um, culprit, I think, um, is like the biggest reason I think a lot of people struggle to, to, to keep interested is that when people are doing talks and lectures, it's too much reading. There's too much um, standing in front of a, uh, say if you, so everyone's in, a, in, in one room. So everyone, so there's a hundred people, everyone watching one monitor. And when you're doing the same thing over and over again, there's no sort of energy and there's no kind of new kind of vibe to it. And um, like that's another reason with the, with the podcast as well is I switch things up all the time because having something fresh makes you more alive, if you know what I mean. And when a, if a, if a lecturer is doing the same sort of thing over and over again, and like the one thing I realize is a common practice that everyone tends to do is that because obviously a lecturer can only keep within the knowledge that they know, they then teach the same exact way, like they, they'll teach class the exact same way for like five years straight. Like sometimes they'll not change it up. Like obviously some, pla- some people do change it up, but that's why it's like trying to find a way to make people want to stay and to kind of minimize, like for example, uh, having an hour lecture um, might be long. I'm not sure what your thoughts are. It might be too long, might be too short, but kind of doing a way that makes it more interactive is I think a good way I think they have to kind of like base it around yeah my my experience with lectures is pretty is pretty much just college and and uh, university so at college it was if the lecture is speaking you don't look at your computer you don't use it you don't touch it you just stay at the front uh, at university it was very different so it was up to you what you did with your PC. You could either follow along or you could watch the lecturer go through stuff at the front. It wasn't really like a lot of like sitting and staring at the front and stuff like that. Like mm-hmm. I'd say it was more that in the like first three weeks of the course as a whole. Okay. Because after that, like whatever they're teaching works alongside um, the assignments. Mm-hmm. So you ended up doing what they were teaching on your assignment as they taught it. So it was kind of like, um, kind of like listening to a tutorial, yeah. like with your headphones on when you're working. Um, and the lecturers were all, uh, for the most part, like they they found a way of. of making it interesting like like for example my favorite lecture from second year because i did a module called character modeling mm-hmm. um which i learned which i took purely because i wanted to learn to brush uh, i had no intentions of ever becoming a character artist i'd like to learn it at some point but i enjoy doing doing environments and stuff um and for the lecture on like how to bake a character out uh, one of my lecturers, Dan Webster, he uh, he turned up in a full like chef outfit with like a big ass mustache and <laughs> yeah, um, it was brilliant. Um, and he's a wiki character artist as well. Yeah. Um, but it's 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 like little things like that that just make makes it more fun. Exactly. It's I, th- I th- so this is the thing. So it's like um, so I. I so we have a um, so when I was um, in Alberta, uh, so the lecturer I always bring up is a guy called Ryan because Ryan was like, he just he was always like the the, the lecturer same as your, your lecturer like he, he yeah. there was never a dull moment with Ryan because there was so much energy so much passion, uh, but then he would also have his his moment where he would uh, be in like constant focus mode like, and he would take the time to really go into depth uh, about how to help you out as much as possible. And yeah, hundred percent. There's obviously that balance between the two, and um, it's getting make, make sure that the lecturers that obviously are constantly like interacting. Obviously, um, they're very busy people as well. So there's that. That's why I always like to bring that point up because I understand that um, it's 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 not the easiest. Like it's um, being a teacher is not an easy job, and, and I think it's a very underpaid profession based on what they provide. But the one thing I there's one question I was going to ask. Do you know when you have a class of like a hundred people plus? Is there is that yeah. getting taught by only one person? Uh, 
because that's usually a lot of there's people. yeah usually there's like two or three lecturers, so there'll be one at the front and then there'll be one or two like wandering around joking people's work like. I think I think the biggest example that I can give is we had a module in, fir- in final year called AdMod, which was advanced modeling. Um, and because it taught it was taught to hard surface artists, character artists, and environment artists, each week was a different um, skill set that was being taught. So like one week you'd have an environment lecture, another week you'd have a character lecture, mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And what we did was we shifted around the room depending on what was being taught. So if you wanted to, uh, if your assignment was a character assignment, then, because like, the assignments were like mini art tests, right? Yeah. Uh, if you were one of the character artists, you'd sit in the middle and you'd have a character ledger. If you were any of the other two, you'd sit towards the edges and the lecturers would come around and talk to you while you're working on your work and give you some feedback and uh, fix any issues and stuff like that. And usually the lecturers were one environment artist, one character artist and one hard surface artist. Mm-hmm. Um, That's awesome. Yeah, it was, it was, it was pretty cool. Like, I think it's like... Um, so th- like this, is, th- this is always... <coughs> That's okay. Like this is always the hard thing I think when it comes to the teacher aspect because I don't know how many artists are going into teaching. Like obviously there's a lot of artists going into teaching through online like websites and stuff and developing their brand through online learning and stuff because I think it's naturally the easiest thing for a freelancer or, or whatever. I think it's the most it's more comfortable for them because obviously there's there's they're around their own home, they can do the way they want to do, whereas if they're going to actually do it as a job, um it becomes a bit more challenging and but the, so there's a few things that you've raised there that I wanted to bring up. So I did a, um, so the one thing I've been doing quite a lot on Twitter um, lately is I've been, uh, um, what do you call it? What was it called when you ask like a questionnaire thing? What's it called uh, on Twitter? The poll. poll. That's the one. Yeah. So I've been doing a bunch of random polls through uh, on Twitter. So uh, by the way, if you um, tune in, uh, make sure to go uh, check out um, our Twitter. All the stuff will be in the description below. Um, I'm at Ross Baxter. Art. I believe you're James Ward 3D. Yeah, yeah, I'm nice and original. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> Keeping it simple, exactly. That's the best way to do it, man. Um, so, I did a poll. At, um, so I've, d- I've done two. So, um, or well, two as of re- very recent. So the first one uh, was I asked, "What do you get taught the most in 3D?" And it was kind of what I expected. So the I put so the top one was basics. So these were the four ones I had as as, as options. So basics, hard surface art. Zebrush sculpting, and then what was the fourth one that I did? Uh, or um, industry industry techniques. So I had those four. Um, so obviously they, they all come together as one. But the obvious one, so the majority of people selected basics. And then the second one was, so I think it was like seven, uh, 65% of universities teach, or well, not universities. Obviously this is based off my following, so it, um, it could be wrong. But based on the amount of following I had, it was a... Uh, I felt it was a, a fair enough judgment to go by. So 65% was basics, um, 15, 20% was industry standard, uh, one or two percent was ZBrush, and then the rest was hard surface. So like five or ten percent, I don't know. But it shocked. It, I'm not sure if the word sh- was, is shocked, but um, so I'm really glad. So my university does it, and your university does it. But there's hardly, uh, based on the poll, like nobody teaches sculpting. Um, as much, and I'm aware that there's a lot of studios that actually don't require you to know sculpting at all. Believe it or not, I know that's going to shock you, but there's some. Um, I've been told, based off my journey, uh, from uh, senior artists that sometimes ZBrush isn't actually a thing in their studio, and that and that was a big shocker for me. Um, I know you, you, I see your face right now. You're even a bit surprised. Yeah. Um, so it depends. Um, so there's depends a lot. Depends on what the what they're working on, I suppose. Doesn't exa- it? Exactly. But to me, so ZBrush is obviously industry standard and it's my favorite software. So ZBrush is the thing I use. But ZBrush is one of those things that I think I, 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 like education needs to do more of. Like it's, it's more of like the kind of, I guess, because everything mm-hmm. is always kind of basics. I, I'm not sure what your thoughts are on that. Uh, yeah, I think, I think more people need to 
need to be taught it. But at the same time, I can understand why. Um, so, for m I can only really speak from from experience with, with my course. But um, on my course, we were taught the basics in first year, like literally, like how to use the software. Uh, we actually got like a 30 minute lecture <laughs> uh, on ZBrush like we had to make a candle which became infamous um, among the students Right. but uh, like we weren't really taught like the ins and outs of the software we weren't really taught different techniques of making that candle it was just kind of like here's a cylinder go into ZBrush subdivide it a couple of times make a candle. Um, You're magically a ZBrush master after a candle. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, we've made a candle, people. <laughs> um, and then in second year, particularly for environment modeling, so the first semester we had to do a sci-fi scene, so we were taught trim sheets and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Then second semester we had to do an organic environment, and there were a couple of ZBrush lectures in there for environment modeling specifically. Awesome. Um, if you did the character modeling module, you were in ZBrush both semesters Perfect. because you were sculpting a character. So for for the first semester, you created an anatomically correct human male or female, mm -hmm. uh, and then you textured that using your reference photos. Um, and then in second semester, you sculpted and retopped and made game ready. Uh, a World of Warcraft character. Oh, right. oh wait, so so they actually choose like so, as in like World War, World of Warcraft is like a topic, or is that just you choose whatever you want to make? Uh, it had to be World of Warcraft style. Okay, no, that's, that's it. Could either awesome. be realistic World of Warcraft, or it could be like in line with uh with the World of Warcraft models. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you were set at like a a poly count and stuff like that. Yeah, definitely. I think it was like 15k for the full body. Okay. Uh, as you can imagine, most people just went with the World of Warcraft style. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't think anyone actually went realistic on, on this. Uh, but that was taught by Daniel Webster and Greg Panic, who are both nuts at character sculpting. And they're both big uh, World of Warcraft fans as well. In fact, uh, Greg's got a little like orc beard. Where it's like, uh, oh, that's it's, cool. yeah, yeah, yeah. It, he's like clean shaven, like all around, and then like just here, like on his on his chin, he's just got like a little braid that comes down here. Just do it, <laughs> <laughs> Um, and they're both fantastic. Uh, I learned loads from both of them actually. Um, no, but that's, that's and a, then that's a, that's a cool thing though. Sorry to cut you off, but it's like so having that as a. Having an, so when you're getting taught to make a, cer a certain style, but having a, or an actual teacher who actually loves the style, like that, yeah. that makes it even way better because his passion will just rub off on everyone else. Like you'll just the energy will be like so much better. Oh yeah, yeah, hundred percent. And then we were even taught ZBrush for hard surface modeling as well. So uh, we had another module called hard surface. Uh, in the First semester, you made a low poly like micro machines kind of car. Mm -hmm. You also did a low poly like mobile spec Titanfall mech, and you did a low poly uh, Overwatch weapon right. as well. And then in second semester, uh, I'm trying to remember what it was. Oh yeah, you, you could either do a gun, a suit of armor. Or I think it was a car it was the other one, but like each each of the lectures, like I remember there was a very specific lecture, and it was like different methods of subdividing your models and stuff. And one of them was ZBrush, like with the ZBrush Boolean method. So you create your base mesh, take it to ZBrush, Boolean it out, smooth it. That's your high poly. Yeah. Um, so is that which is um, that common now? Like is um how can I say this? Uh, would you say like the reason for them doing that was purely to just highlight 
um, a lot of range to the students just to see what they liked, or was it um, mainly, do you think, based around getting the, the right skill set? Or do you think a bit of both? I think it was a bit of both. So, every single, well, the most of the electrician staff uh, staffs are all X industry. Mm -hmm. So, sometimes they'd be, like, they'd, they'd show you the old school method of doing it first. And then they'd show you how to kind of do it, like, if you're going into a studio today. Yep. Or they'll show you, like, Naughty Dog's method or something like that. Which, for me, is a method that I tend to use quite a lot now. Okay, awesome. Um, that was taught to me in my final year. Wait, Naughty Dog method? <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, like, what, what do you mean? Uh, like how they iterate and stuff like that. As in, like, modular? Uh, like, modular? Or do you mean, like... Modular, lighting, um, sometimes materials, like how they iterate on that. Mm -hmm. um, I remember in our lecture we were actually showing a website where uh, it was kind of documented for... It was one of the Uncharted games, and I can't remember which one it was. But uh, I'll see if I can find it, because um, I can't remember where it is now. That's right. You just made you just made me remember so much things I wanted to talk about. <laughs> just to mention the word uncharted, so trust me, it is all good, man. You've just made everything just kind of flow <laughs> naturally. You read my mind for this podcast. This is great. <laughs> Makes my job super easy. You want to take over the podcast, mate? I'll, I'll, okay. I'll, you ask the you ask the que <laughs> you ask the questions. I'll just chill. I'll just uh, <laughs> right. Hello, everyone. I am James Ward. <laughs> I'm from Derby. I, 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 I'm a Scotsman. Scotsman. I can't speak <laughs> your accent. <laughs> no, but it's like uh, there's uh, you. Uh, before I uh, go off a random tangent, the one thing I just want to say about what you said there about Uncharted is so because of Uncharted being so um, such. First of all, amazing game, um, legendary, legendary game. Uh, can't can't go wrong. It's, it's so it's games like Uncharted, games like God of War that. Were the were like the go to games if you know what I mean like those were the games especially the latest God of War like that like when he, when when he's just like boy <laughs> and like everything just comes into the story and it's just um I, I just don't... can't not see Tilk from Stargate oh, every right, single okay. time yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That, that, that's that's the thing though so I haven't seen Stargate in no joke it, it's got to be a decade it's it's a long time so I didn't get that like. Because I think he went even deeper on his voice. Like he's he already has an incredibly deep voice, but yeah. because he's went even deeper, or like the way he, he like do you like the way he's delayed his like his wording, like the way he speaks, it's yeah, like, yeah. It slightly kind of it, I don't know. It just completely wiped out for me. But I don't know. Like Uncharted for me was this kind of um, and God of War. Um, they so going to relate to what we're talking about here. So like re modular stuff and that. But the one thing that they master so well is that because they keep reusing things that they're not like this is this is the thing about artists um and i've mentioned it i think once or twice in the podcast but cheating is okay it's just down to the word what we mean by the word cheating so using things over and over again it's fine so just keep reusing them and learn ways how to speed up the process because all these um, major game companies are constantly like they're they're tight for time. Obviously, sometimes sometimes they're blessed for like multiple years and stuff, but it depends. But really think about um, how to like reuse things because it's such a thing that um, too many people have this kind of um, what's the word? Oh, I want to make everything kind of phrase. If you know what I mean, um, or like they want to make it exactly a certain way. It's weird because I was literally talking about this to one of the guys that I mentor mm -hmm. last like literally last night right um and I was saying like you gotta get into the mindset of working smart yep so cause um he's he's working on a portfolio piece but he had a couple of assets in it that weren't his and they were crate like just some like wooden crates and like a metal barrel or something like that and some pallets and I was like, I'd rec like I, I recommended that he just make them himself. They'll take him like fifteen minutes, um, even if he took them through ZBrush and stuff, because then he can say that everything in that scene is his. But on top of that, he can start building like an asset library for him to use in the future on other projects. Yeah. So 
like for example i i have a ridiculous amount of plants <laughs> and trees and rocks and stuff that's awesome just, just from like the last year and a half um more than last year than anything like for example whenever i'm making uh like a foliage atlas like particularly with grass i can make 20 like grass models from a single atlas mm -hmm. easy and then like one that breaks everything up two i can use them in the future and three like it takes 15 minutes to do it like if you just put in that little bit of time very early on like you can improve the look of your scene you can help yourself out in the future and it's 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 no effort at all really exactly like it's it's i think it's i don't know like um reusing things is such like I'm, I'm really glad you mentioned that because when it comes to um working smart and getting ready for the industry like this is one of the things that you have to obviously develop and it's through that sort of mindset that obviously not owning everything or having to be so pernickety all the time well not pernickety but um so kind of um I guess demanding of yourself in a way and you have to kind of like trust that um, well just I wouldn't say just trust but acknowledge that it's a team thing and you have to realize that going back and forth up the pipeline and stuff like things are going to be like changing all the time there's going to be different discussions you're gonna to have to remake things and the closest if you have a folder that is um, an asset folder that you can instantly grab something to make something quicker just to use as a base mesh you've instantly saved like a good few hours of your day and if you're working your typical nine to five job and you're limited so you've only got your eight hours that two hours is like a quarter of your day saved so really think about where to kind of um use things and stuff uh, and get into a habit of it for the future just so you're you're ready and um, <coughs> like so like obviously like we've talked about a lot of different things um and uh, relating to art and stuff so there's one there's one um question i wanted to ask you um i'm not i don't think i mentioned uh I, I, have I asked? There's a lot of questions I haven't asked, and it's, it's nice. It's nice getting a refresher. Um, so, how do you choose the projects you create for your portfolio? <laughs> I'm just instantly uh, firing you with that big question. So, so at uni, I had the nickname of Captain Overscope. Right, <laughs> so, Captain Overscope. Um, that is literally official. Is no longer James. <laughs> so, uh, I've reined it in a lot now, but. Um, I used to, like, f for my assignments, like, I'll, I'll, I'll say my assignments first and then I'll, I'll, I'll say my personal projects, but okay. for my assignments, we got the brief and then I was like, okay, what do I want to learn from this on top of what's already being taught? So, there's... <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. What's up here? I don't know what's going to come here. What's going on? <sighs> There's an environment that I did from a second year, second year, second semester for environment modeling. And it was a Dragon Age themed environment. Mm -hmm. And we were, t <laughs> we were told to do an exterior organic diorama. Mm -hmm. I did a whole canyon. <laughs> um, <laughs> totally, <laughs> but, totally, totally do it's the purpose, but anyway, continue. <laughs> and then, and then I, I found out at the start of my third year is that my lecturer was putting up on board on the board and he was like don't be this guy <laughs> <laughs> i got it done but like um obviously because of the scale of it like the smaller details were lost and it wasn't as good as it could have been yeah um <laughs> oh god i'm just getting flashbacks to that good but memories, um good memories with with that environment in particular i wanted to learn about large-scale optimization in terms of foliage and when you've got all these different things going on and how to get it working efficiently and stuff looking back on it the 14 frames that i was getting on uh, in ue4 wasn't great um there was a lot of foliage <laughs> and uh but from that i learned how to optimize foliage i knew how to build it in the modeling package from the get-go better and it helped me no end in my final year 
Yeah. I also learned a little bit about uh, LODs and stuff like that, like UE4 system of LODs. Uh, in my final year, it was it was a lot stricter. So there was only really like one module where I was kind of given free reign on what to what two modules and free reign on what to do. Like one of them was uh, mastering the artistry of game environments, which was mage for short. And for twelve weeks, we were allowed to make whatever outdoor environment we wanted and then in the second semester we did a state change so if you did it nice and sunny and pristine and all of that second semester it's snow or like a crate of dynamite's gone off in the middle of it and half of it's burnt down or whatever um but that was about reusing the assets that you'd done and it was just like changing shaders and stuff yeah uh the other module was finding your project and you could do literally whatever you wanted and that was my throne room. Um, for that, I knew I wanted to do an organic environment. Mm -hmm. I knew I wanted to do something fantasy-esque. Because up until that point, at least when I was planning the environment out over the summer between second and third year, uh, I've mostly done sci-fi up to that point. Yeah, I was the same as you. Yeah, so I wanted to kind of, you know, get into the organic side of things a bit more because, like, my, my dream studio is, is Bioware, okay. so, like, they've got a very even balance of organic and sci-fi. Definitely. Um, so, that was kind of my inspiration for uh, for the throne room. And like in the East Midlands, there's a fair bit. Of, there's a fair few castles as well. Yeah, because like the reason, um, like the reason why I asked the question is because like, um, so, um, I've been getting quite a. It's it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. I, um, it's it's weird how it's kind of become a trend on my podcast, and a lot of pe so a pe people keep asking like, how do they, how do you choose a project? And um, to me, naturally, that always seems uh, an obvious answer. If that makes sense, like you just do what you want to do. But I think yeah. I think. It's got to a point though that so many people have got to that point that they start doubting their own passion like they start doubting what they actually want they and they and they purely always they, they care too much about what the studio wants like i understand that it's all about getting a job and i get that but your portfolio should describe who you are and what you want so for example my portfolio Every piece in that portfolio, none of it has been based around a studio first. And I know that may sound crazy to say, but the reason why I do that is because I know that if, um, through just obvious, it's, it's an obvious answer, but it's like, the more passion I um, I have for a piece, the more passion you, and more quality is going to be delivered. And it's I think that's obvious if you know what I mean. Like you, you agree that yeah, yeah. If, you, if you enjoy the piece, you're going to make a, um, a better piece. Because, for example, I'm doing a Game of Thrones piece at the moment. Um, uh, so I'm live streaming on Twitch. So I'm making a throne of Bran the Broken and trying to highlight uh, a kind of sort of uh, lore and my own sort of interpretation of being of Bran being the Night King. And I wouldn't enjoy this project as much as I have if I didn't love Game of Thrones, if that makes sense, if I didn't love the environment. And when, so when people keep asking, like, what kind of projects should I be making? The, the only thing that you need to prove that's the that relates to the game in the studio is that it's game ready and that you can show the pipeline whereas everything else is like obviously like people can argue, use the debate of um, obviously like say if I I'm making a triple A AAA environment and then uh, I applied I applied with a applied to a I don't know a mobile company uh, or a mobile games company I don't think the portfolio is going to really make much sense to that but you know what I mean like that's the only questions that kind of kind of get brought up if you know what I mean yeah I mean I I think if your portfolio is solid it doesn't like you should be able to apply to whatever studio yeah. and they'd be able to they'd be able to see oh like for example just you when you mentioned the the AAA portfolio and then apply for a mobile studio I think if they like at the end of the day your portfolio is there to show that this is what you can do this is the best of your work or this is the work that best describes you, or whatever. Yeah. Um, 
because I know there's some, some different opinions on that, but uh, if you if you can hand in your portfolio to a company and confidently be able to say, I can do this, then there is no reason why you shouldn't be able to at least get that art test for them to be able to see okay yes he can definitely do this and he, and he can also work to the guidelines that we have to work to yeah. and then if you smash that then there's no reason why you shouldn't get the interview and hopefully the job at the end of it for me personally I always try I really enjoy learning mm-hmm. which is really weird because I really wasn't the best student as a kid but um like whenever I take on a new project it's like okay well what can I practice or what can I learn or you know like something along those lines mm-hmm. um, like for example the, the current project that I'm working on I'm going back to sci-fi oh, I didn't I've, know this this is, this is new news so you're back to sci-fi yeah um, you know the game that's the Republic uh, what's it called sorry Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm intrigued. You know, I'm, in, I'm interested. You know the Taris apartment on the first planet when, uh, like, after you crash land on the planet and you've got like a abandoned apartment hideout and stuff where you, okay. it's like your your party area. Basically, trying to redo that, but like as a modern AAA kind of environment rather yeah, than just definitely. like a square room. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it nice with, and simple. <laughs> With literally four props, um, but the problem with that is is the design elements. So, Star Wars has such a, a minimalistic style. Like, for example, I went back and uh, I keep on telling my mates about this, but I went back and I watched uh, Attack of the Clones for the first time in, in a while, and I was forty five minutes into the movie by the time I saw four different wall panels. Because everything was just seamless, and I was still like, because oh. <laughs> because I'd already made my trim sheet, and I was there like, oh, this will be a cool detail. I've seen this in Star Wars before, and then like, I saw vaguely similar environments, and I was like, son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I got inspired to do that from Poem Studios, who were doing the uh, the mod of a modern. Not see a public game in Unreal Engine, right? Uh, and they got shut down by Disney, oh, if I remember rightly. Uh, but it, you you can still find some footage of like pre-alpha stuff online, and it looked fantastic. Um, but yeah, and and like the cool thing with with that project is I'm working with a character artist and I'm working with an animator. Mm-hmm. So you're work, working together as a team, getting different ideas different interpretations and stuff yeah yeah like for example we're, we're basing the main character on Keanu Reeves as well so Sick. like yeah, yeah. Um, that's really cool <laughs> um, it's a good spin off as well because it, it Keanu literally goes with everything like in it he, yeah, he, yeah, just, yeah. he just he, 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 he can rock anything he just like, yeah. he can be I can know like, an advert for I don't know a chocolate bar everyone will buy that chocolate bar for the rest of their life it's Keanu well, he, he, he can uh, he can come back to a franchise after twenty years, and I'm pretty sure that he died in the final movie as well. So he's managed to do that. Yeah. So my boy. Because <laughs> like, oh, oh, I'm so glad you've mentioned all this because you've this, um, so you so you've mentioned two really topics that I really oh, this is this is going to I don't have a clue how you've done it, man. Like so <laughs> the next so so the thing I wanted to uh, talk about based on what you said there so. Obviously, you've started a new sci-fi project, uh, and then the main point that you said there is that you love learning. So, what's your thoughts? So, this is something that I've realised that's changed my mindset. So, normally, I would always do one project at a time and, con- and make sure I finish it, right? But I've then re- um, I've just started this new thing in which um, I'm going to do multiple projects from now on instead of just doing one. What's your thoughts on doing mul- multiple tr- projects at the same time? Um... <laughs> I actually had this problem when I was at uni. Um, so, 
in my final year, we started in September. Mm-hmm. By mid October, I was already starting to feel burnout. Um, I had, over the course of the academic year, I had about seven environments I had to do. Seven. Yeah. What, what, what year was this? Fourth year. Final. Uh, third year. Okay, okay. So, I'll just finish my third year, sorry. And, um, so I was spending two days a week on each project, and I'd had, and I had one day a week where I didn't have to model, and that was the day that I was in uni. Because installing all my scripts and my preferences and stuff like that on each PC was a it was a nightmare at the time, uh, which could take me like an hour, so it was like, there's no point. 